18 books. Then you have no excuse and you should have seen our chat. Bridgerton meets seven, but make it boring. You know? So like, it's like, what are you doing, huh? So I did count how many books I read, but then I realized that there was like a couple that I read on my Kindle and, um, and then I lost count. 18 books. Is that more than last month? Possibly. Oh, who knows? Okay, this deck is insane. I'm just gonna put it down, okay? First book that I read in April. Did I say May at some point? I may have done. Um, but anyway, the thumbnail should have told you this was April, so you should have been able to be mentally correct if I said that. Anyway, first book that I read in April was Kingdoms of Death by Christopher Rocchio. I know Alex and I have not had our chat yet as of the filming of this video. I think we will have just had our chat like last night um, when this goes up. So you should already know what I think of this because you should already have watched that chat. I guess I forgive you if you're not this far in the series and you didn't want to get spoiled, I guess. But if you are this far in the series, then you have no excuse and you should have seen our chat. Anyway, this is the fourth book in the Sun Eater series. Book four was split. So book five will be what was originally the second half of book four. And if I have a complaint about it, it is that. But I didn't know that going into it. And so for being a book that is split, for being a first half of something, it is remarkably good. Nevertheless, I do think it's weaker than the other installments because it does feel a little bit less like a whole complete thought, if that makes sense. Like it does feel a little bit like we stopped at intermission. Like he, he did a good job leaving it somewhat conclusive and like kind of wrapping up this story in this book to feel, you know, it doesn't literally feel like it just got chopped, but like it, it, there's just like, it's lacking that certain je ne sais quoi. Now maybe I'm projecting, maybe it's because I knew it was the first half of something that I just like went in expecting to feel that way. And it's like confirmation bias. Am I using confirmation bias correctly? Not sure. But you know what I mean regardless. I mean, I, I think it's excellent. And the only really like flaw that I can identify is this sort of like kind of vague sense of a lack of completeness, which I can't really fault it for since it is um, the first half of what was a longer, massively long book. I still think it's excellent. So yeah, I'm, right now I'm really looking forward to talking to Alex about it, but I will have already done that by the time you're seeing this. So I'm assuming that went swimmingly and uh, and that it's well worth watching whatever it is that we're going to have set. Next up, I read The Willful Princess and the Piebald Prince by Robin Hobb. This is a novella that um, Mara and I were advised we should read after reading Live Ship Traders, but before we dive into Tawny Man. And since we planned in the stack to start Tawny Man, then we snuck in also this, since again, we were advised that we should read this before we start Tawny Man. And Having uh, now read this and the first Tawny Man book, I absolutely understand why people say that. I also, I do not know why I went into this little book expecting it to be a nice, happy little, little book. And it might, might be the darkest thing that Robin Hood has ever written. I just, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know what I was thinking, expecting to pick up a Hobb book and it be fine. That's on me, really. It's really, really, really good. And I absolutely see why people say to read it. Um, before not just because like that's the best experience for reading this but because reading this enhances the experience of reading Fool's Errand. So yes it's, this was great. Hop, Robin Hop is great and um jeez what packs a punch this little book does. Next up was the Blades and Bodice Rippers book club pick. I read it very early in the month. Oh, actually I read, well, I read Kingdoms of Death really early in the month because I just like couldn't resist. I read uh, Lady's Guide to Mischief and Mayhem early in the month because my audio hold came in quite early. So I was like, well, I'm reading this now, I guess. So um, it's been a minute since I read this and we did have our live show um, to chat about it. And as, as you might have guessed or suspected, or if you're a betting man, you probably could have placed bets that I would hate this, or at least that I would like it the least out of all of us. And I hated this. I gave it one star. I was permitted to rant for a bit in the live show and to bring, you know, harsh everyone's vibe and to yuck everyone's yum. <laughs> um, so I had my opportunity to vent and unleash my fury. But basically, Mara talks about going with itness. I had zero going with itness with this book. Mara and I disagree about whether or not it's possible to have um, historical, whether or not historical accuracy is a thing in fiction. I tend to fall much more in the camp of yes, there is. And there are some exceptions to that when you are, in my opinion, when you are deliberately playing with historical fact, like you know how history went and you are purposely altering some parts of that for some artistic purpose or for some narrative purpose, you know, that you are, this is a thing you are consciously knowingly changing. Or also stories that are so 
completely not to be taken seriously. Such utterly campy, absurd romps, you know, like more in the lines of like sketch comedy where like, you know, we're not taking anything seriously. So why would I take historical accuracy seriously kind of thing? And this doesn't fall into any of those camps. This is just like playing so fast and loose with historical anything, really. It is a, a book that takes itself too seriously to get away with that. But it's not exactly a serious book. It is a fluffier book, but it's not fluffy enough to be fun. Um, it's too serious to be fun, but it's not serious enough to take historical accuracy seriously. I don't know how else to explain it. And then like I, my one sentence review of this when I finished it and marked it on read on Goodreads. I don't usually write reviews because I'm terrible about that. But I did write a one sentence review for this on Goodreads and it was Bridgerton meets Seven but make it boring. <laughs> because this is a murder mystery that is akin to the movie Seven, but it's like, you know, a wild romantic romp that is not nearly as fun or as colorful as Bridgerton. Bridgerton is at least fun. So this is like if Bridgerton was was really boring or if Seven was really boring and we mushed them together. So yeah, um, do not recommend. But if you want to hear different opinions, obviously go listen to Amanda, Mara, and Bethany who will tell you why they liked it. Um, but I can't speak to that position because I do not hold that position. Next up, I read Fool's Errand by Robin Hobb, which is the first book in the 20 Man trilogy. As I said, I absolutely understand why we are encouraged to read Willful Princess first. It has some really important context for what's going on in this book. Um, this is the this is the first book in a trilogy, but it is the third trilogy in a series of series in the realm of the Elderlings. So even though it is the, a first book, it is extremely spoilery to really talk about it because it is still built, it's, it's standing on the shoulders of the previous two trilogies, which is a sort of unique circumstance with Robin Hobb. So I, what I can tell you about Fool's Errand is that I am perhaps the most disappointed with this that I have been with any Robin Hobb book. I don't think this is a bad book, by no means. Robin Hobb is an amazing writer. And this book, if it was, if it, uh, this is basically, I'm saying on a scale of Hobb, this is lackluster. On a scale of literature in general, or, or sci-fi fantasy literature in general, this is phenomenal. But I know Hobb can do, in my opinion, or at least what I'm, what I'm looking for in books, Rob can do a lot more, can do a lot better, and has satisfied me a lot more and better in other books. I'm accustomed to Robin Hobb books being relatively grand in scope uh, in terms of amount of time that passes, amount of like plot lines and, and world things that occur, amount of characters, amount of various threads and things. There's just like a lot, I'm accustomed to a lot going on in a Robin Hobb book. Um, and this book is extremely narrow in scope and it feels much more like an adventure of the week. It is one of the best adventure of the week books that I can imagine. But when I've I have been made accustomed to something more, something bigger, something longer from Robin Hobb. So entering a Robin Hobb book, that is just my expectation. And I, I think this is setting the groundwork for some, some more bigger things. I have no idea how the rest of Tawny Man is going to go. I wouldn't be surprised if the rest of Tawny Man does deliver that grandness of scope that I am expecting. But this first book does not do that. Whereas the first book in Farseer and the first book in Live Ship Traders, even at the first book, does deliver that big scope. So I just kind of felt like, oh, is that it? Not because like it's bad, but because this book, it just felt so small and so narrow. Still ex excellently well executed. Uh, the character work is, is amazing. I just, I just felt like, is that it? <laughs> Which again, this is on a scale of Hob. So compared to most other authors and most other books, it blows it out of the water. But compared, comparing this to the other Hob books I've read, it is the weakest one in my opinion. Next up I read King Lear and I should probably do the next two while we're at it um, because we did the triple Lear in April. I say we did, um, we have not had our chat yet because of life reasons, um, Heather was not able to do the chat in April, but we are still gonna do the chat at the end of May. I told her I may need to reread all of these before we do that chat because I read these towards the beginning of April thinking we would have the chat in April. But anyways, King Lear is a reread. It is a Shakespeare play. It is not actually one of my favorite Shakespeare plays, although it has some of my favorite like moments or like bits of dialogue. There's some excellent material in King Lear, but overall like King Lear is not among my favorite plays. It's, I know why it's so well regarded and I know why it's so, it's so often produced, but it has never been one of my personal favorites. That said, we'll obviously get into this more and I don't know if Heather agrees with me. I don't know that she's actually read these yet. I have no idea. Well, we have been pretty negative on the Hogarth project, um, which is how this all began, but the Hogarth retelling Dunbar by Edward St. Aubin of King Lear is 
possibly my favorite of the Hogarth retellings. I think the this understood the assignment, <laughs> as the kids like to say. Whereas the uh, the big problem with the other Hogarths is like they just kind of fall short in 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 many different ways. So this book more than the others, I think kind of nailed what a retelling should be. And then was also an engaging read. I'm excited to talk about this with Heather, although again, I may need to reread this. And then also The Queens of Innislear, which is also a retelling of King Lear. And I'd heard this book was criticized for being extremely slow. And I get why. If you have not read King Lear, have not seen King Lear, are not intimately familiar with the plot beats of King Lear, why you would find this boring. Or I guess if you're just like not interested in King Lear, like I guess if you are familiar with King Lear and think King Lear is boring, I guess I could see also. But personally being familiar with King Lear, I was for most of the book utterly fascinated with where and when it was like massively diverging from King Lear, but while also being so entirely retelling of King Lear where it's like recognizably King Lear. That it was, it's taking huge liberties with the story. I mean, not that it shouldn't, because I mean, this book doesn't purport to be King Lear. But I mean, like where it diverges from it is like kind of massive for some things. And for other things, it is extremely spot on. In the most part, what it kind of is doing is providing context for the behaviors of some of the characters, because King Lear is focused on King Lear. You get, it's a play, so you don't really have like a POV in the way that books do, but it does kind of center King Lear. And then this book centers his daughters, who are obviously big, important figures in the play, but you don't really explore their what would make them choose to say and do the things that they do. It's more King Lear responding and reacting to what they're saying and doing. So this does the opposite, right? Like there's a king who is like the Lear figure and he's kind of behaving in a way that you recognize as being how King Lear behaves, but he's we're not really doing him. We're not really interested in like what's driving his behavior. We're interested in what's driving his daughter's behavior. So it's kind of like flipping the script where it's all, it's very similar in the story, but it does take liberties, immense liberties at times. But it's, 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 inter it's sort of like switched focus and offered potential explanations for some arguably baffling behavior on the part of the daughters. Because there are some things that King Lear's daughters do. And when that's not the focal point and we don't really get explanations for why they do what they do, um, it does kind of feel like, why in the F would they would they do that? Why would they think that? Why would they want that? So this offers, even though the story is different from that story, offers a reason why some of that behavior might be the way that it is. And again, where it would change from the story had me on the edge of my seat being like, well, okay, but this is already different. So it's going to have to end up being different. Or is it? Or is it going to like somehow circle back into being King Lear? So I feel like if you are intimately familiar with King Lear, this is a fascinating book. And I do think it stands on its own. But it's especially fascinating if you're waiting to see how the parts that are like King Lear, um, are, are they going to keep being that way? And the parts that are not, are they going to end up being that way? Are they going to keep being different? And if so, what is that sort of like ripple effect? Because they do, you know, this is a holistic story. The things affect each other. So if this part of it is not like King Lear, that's going to have an effect on the parts of it that ostensibly were like King Lear. But when those plot points converge they have an effect on each other. So like, where is this going to end up? So I, as someone familiar with King Lear, was like, what is she going to do? What, where is this going to go? Um, so I thought it was very well done. Um, and I'm again excited to chat about it with Heather at the end of May. Next up, I read Tiz by Frank McCourt, which is um, his second set of memoirs. Uh, Angela's Ashes is about his childhood. Tiz is about his, um, when he's a young man, when he first comes back to America. And um, Angela's Ashes is still my favorite so far. I have not yet read Teacher Man. I will be reading that in May. Um, Tiz is just kind of, it still has that, the charming storytelling of Frank McCourt. His narrative voice is so strong and it is, as I say, extremely charming. It's just sort of, it's a very lyrical storytelling style. And he, it's a very distinct authorial voice. Like he sort of leaps off the page. Uh, in how he's telling his own life story. And that is definitely present throughout Tiz, the same as Angela's Ashes. It's just Tiz is a lot more depressing um, because in Angela's Ashes, even though terrible things are happening, it's kind of told to you through the lens of the child that Frank McCourt was when this was happening to him. So he's telling it the way that he as a child was experiencing it, which takes a little of the, the sting out of it and adds some sort of, adds a good deal of humor because of like a child's um, misunderstanding of things going on around him. Um, Tiz, he's 
we don't have that because we wouldn't because he's an adult. So it's more just, it's still a, a wonderful style of storytelling and it's still really engaging. It's just very sad. <laughs> and so it, it is still really, really good, but it's just much sadder. <laughs> it doesn't, uh, doesn't have this sort of like, I don't know, as depressing as Angela's Ashes is, there is kind of like a sweet, charming, hopeful quality because it's all kind of through a child's eyes. Here, um, we're kind of like um, shattering all that hope and any kind of naive belief in future is kind of challenged and proved to be naive. So it's, it's, it is more depressing. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to Teacher Man. Um, I think this will be the darkest one of the three because he is sort of a young man with no direction, no education, no prospects in life. So in Teacher Man, he's, you know, settled more like he's a teacher. He's not, you know, going around wrecking his own life. <laughs> So I think this will prove to be the saddest one of the three. But nevertheless, I enjoyed it a great deal uh, the second time through, and I would still recommend it. Next up, I read The Cartographers by Peng Shepard, and not much needs to be said about this. I have a full, I think the review video is like half an hour. Uh, it is spoilery, um, but like watch it anyway if you haven't read it because I don't recommend you read this book. This book is, is bafflingly awful, which is why I spent half an hour talking about it. And I promise you in half an hour, I was not able to even scratch the surface of the amount of dumb things are in this book. Um, I had to kind of be choosy because like there are so many dumb things in this book. And if I was to like actually go through every dumb thing, it would be a five hour video and ain't nobody got time for that. So if you want to know what I think about this in full, go check that out. But I think this should make it pretty clear what I think of this book. Next up, uh, I have a book that is I do not have a physical copy of, but um, I was a co-host for the tour.com a hosted by Beautifully Bookish Bethany, and the group book that we were all to read and then be prepared to discuss at the end of it was Remote Control by Nettie Okorafor. I read that on my Kindle, um, so I do not have a physical copy to show you. Um, I This was my first Nettie Okorafor, and I definitely intend to read more from Nettie Okorafor, especially after looking up some reviews for this that kind of were saying uh, people that had read a lot of her books before and now read Remote Control and were like, I like her books, I like her style, this not so much, which made me hopeful because I had always wanted to read Nadia Okora for and I was not, I did not fully connect with that story. And in the live show when we chatted about it on Bethany's channel, we sort of identified what it was that was missing for me and which other Nadia Okora for books would work better for me or readers like me. So I still, I think it was good but it was definitely like lacking a hook um and but plenty of other people on the panel plenty of other people who were co-hosts adored it gave it five stars this was their second or third time through so i am by no means representative of the majority as usual and it wasn't you know anything where it put me off nitty core for i was like as a first book like didn't blow me away but um but now i kind of know what her style is like and i'm I have some advice on on which of her books um are going to work better for me and which I should probably avoid because they're a lot more like remote control. So anyway, um, it was overall, it was good. Um, it was, it was not bad. Next up, uh, the next two, no, next three books are all for the tour.com a -thon. Um, so the next one was Fly Away by Kathleen Jennings. Um, this book was good. It also did kind of disappoint me. I think like, I like the style of the storytelling. It is very lyrical and sort of magical realism-ish. Um, I did kind of walk away feeling like, what was the point? But I, yeah, I did enjoy it. And it kind of reminded me a little bit of We Have Always Lived in the Castle by Shirley, Shirley Jennings? Shirley Jennings? Well, uh, Shirley Jackson, not Jennings. Shirley Jackson. This is Jennings. Okay, we we got it. So if you like Shirley J Jackson, Shirley Jackson's books, you might like this. Um, Shirley Jackson is kind of, I didn't really like at all um, uh, Haunting of Hill House. I much, much preferred We Have Always Lived in the Castle. This kind of, it was, it had some of that vibe to it. Um, and I think in general, the storytelling is quite engrossing. Although I will warn you, it takes, in the beginning, um, it's really kind of hard to tell what's happening. <laughs> I had to like go back several times to be like, did I miss something? And like, no, I didn't. But I'm very confused about who was talking and what's happening. Um, which is, it feels a little intentional, that sort of befuddlement. Because things, as, as you learn more information, it helps you to understand what you just read before, which didn't make sense when you read it, and there was no way that it could have made sense. So it was, it was an intriguing and engrossing and a very atmospheric read, but definitely a lot of flaws. Next up, I read Ring Shout by Peter Jaley Clark, and I'm so relieved to report that I liked this book. I did not full on love it the way I would like to, but especially because I've been quite disappointed with 
other Peter Jelly Clark books, uh, Tram Haunting of Tramcar 5, Dead Jin in Cairo, Master of Jin, which are all kind of connected. I've been very kind of unimpressed with those, but everyone loves Ring Shout. And I was like, please, please let me like it. And I did like it. I think it's a lot better than those books. I did, it did start to have some of the problem that I have with those other books where I just feel like Clark just kind of like goes too far with like magic and speculative elements where it's just, you've, you've overshot the mark, you've overdone it and it's not really adding to the story anymore. It's just absurd. So like I, the speculative element of this uh, where it's sort of like creating like a speculative version of the KKK where they're like, where there are monsters, actual monsters that kind of have to be thought and uh, this sort of like alternate history type of thing. I think the concept is brilliant and I think the concept is like fine on its own. Like that is, that is plenty, that is enough. And it, it just keeps like, it felt that way to me with the, the Jin books um, where it's this feeling of like, I haven't impressed the reader enough. I haven't caught their attention enough. I haven't thrown enough action at them. I'm going to lose them. And it's like overdoing it. And here it wasn't really overdoing it for most of it, which is why it worked for me. But towards the end, like the speculative element that's been throughout this book is, is plenty. It is enough. It is even already approaching being too much. And then it kind of like goes full off the deep end into like speculative wildness, um, which is just like, it, it lacks grounding, it lacks, like, it, it's not really doing anything narratively or thematically anymore. It's just kind of, like, too much. And then that, like, that's what disappoints me. Where I'm like, okay, well, now, now you've kind of lost me. Now this is just ridiculous. But for the most part, like, in general, the, the concept of this and for the most part, the execution absolutely worked for me. I wish he had, like, reeled it in a bit and not gone so wild <laughs> with the speculative aspects of this. Because that's where it lost me. But... Up till that point, fully had me for the most part. And yeah, and the ending, like, it didn't ruin it. I was just like, oh, okay, we're doing that again, where we're just like going ham. So I do absolutely highly recommend this. It's really, really good. But I couldn't give it five stars because of that. I would have liked to have given it five stars. I gave it four. A high four, a great four, a relieved four. <laughs> but I just, I'm finding it's it's too big on the magic and, and you know, unrealistic parts of it. It's, it goes too far, too much, too big, too often. So... Just, that's a warning for you if you're thinking of picking it up. Next up is another book that, again, these are all for Tor.comathon. Uh, this one I only had on my Kindle, do not have a physical copy of it. And that is Empress of Salt and Fortune by Nevo. This was my first Nevo book. And um, even more so than with Fly Away. With Fly Away, I was like, oh, it's a bit confusing. It's kind of hard to tell what's going on sometimes. With Empress of Salt and Fortune, I had to restart it many times. Because I kept being like, nope, I still don't understand. Nope, I still didn't get it. Nope, did I zone out? Nope, nope, nope. <laughs> I restarted it probably five times until I was like, you know what? Maybe I'll figure it out as I go. And I did. I don't think, yeah, it's really hard to pick up what's going on at first. But I ended up quite enjoying it. And I definitely want to read more from Nevo. And it felt, it feels like very, very arm's length kind of storytelling. And I thought that I was finding it interesting, but not like compelling or that I wasn't really connecting with it on an emotional level until something quite upsetting happened. And I was very upset by it. I was like, I guess I'm more attached to these characters than I realized. <laughs> Because I thought I was like, this is interesting, but not, you know, like a story that you really connect to because it's so sort of distant. And, uh, and then I, it <laughs> blindsided me with feelings. So I was like, or I guess I am invested. I know there's two sequels. I don't know if there's going to be more. But yeah, I want to read more. I've heard mixed things about Chosen and the Beautiful and about Siren Queen, the full length books. But I definitely would continue with this sort of series. But anyway, point being. It was kind of a rough start, but I did end up really enjoying it. Next up is the book that my patrons chose for me to read and vlog and review for them. And that was Justice of Kings by Richard Swan. And I ended up not hating this, <laughs> which I mean sounds, I, I think this is a strong debut, but it feels like a debut. So when I like chatted about it in my vlog to my patrons, um, I sort of went into details about what it is that did and didn't work for me, where I thought it was a bit weaker and uh, other things about it that I thought were quite strong for a debut. So in general, I feel like this was a good book and has a lot of promises for this series and for this author. There are some things about it that I was like, I don't know if this is because you're new or because this will always be a problem for you, but that like weren't that I didn't fully love, but overall I thought it was pretty good. And um, the biggest uh, problem that I have with this book is the cover because the main character of this book, the character telling the story, the character whose story this is, is a girl and is not on the cover. The guy on the cover, he's very significant to the plot, but he is not the one telling the story. It is not his story. So I have to think the choice to put him on the cover was the same reason that female authors use initials for their name as opposed to their name because of like the dude bias. That's the only reason I can imagine why their cover looks like this. And that 
that irritates me. Like if your book is about a dude, then yeah, put a dude on the cover. But the book is not about a dude, you know? So like, it's like, what are you doing, huh? What are you doing? Anyway, otherwise, the content, pretty good. We'll continue with the series. Next up is the fourth book in the Sword of Truth series, The Temple of the Winds by Terry Goodkind. The live show for this was on my channel, uh, as me and Bethany are continuing our read along of the Sword of Truth books. This is the book that most stood out in my memory from when I first read these books, because this book is bananas. It is bonkers. It is insane. It still is. <laughs> like, it, it was fresh in my brain, even though it had been years since I read it. Bethany was rereading it and messaging me like, oh, I didn't remember. I was like, oh, I remembered everything about this book because this book is insane. So anyway, the live show for it was on my channel um, where we talked about all the craziness of this book. And the second time through was less hair raising for me, mainly because I was so fully prepared for everything because I had not forgotten any of it. So I wasn't blindsided by anything. I was like, and this is the part where that happens. Yep, here we go. I was less like shocked because I was like, I was ready. I knew where the twists and turns were on this roller coaster. So anyway, um, yeah. Say one thing for Temple of the Winds. Say it's not boring. Next up is the book that my patrons and I buddy read. Um, and that is, or yes, buddy read, yes. Um, <laughs> Muse of Nightmares by Lenny Taylor. Um, we haven't had our patron chat about it yet, but we will shortly. This is the second and concluding book to the Strange of Dreamer duolo Strange the Dreamer duology. And um, this was my second time reading it and it is beautiful. It's magnificent. It's it's so, so good. And I really hope Lenny Taylor is writing right now because like it's been too long. This book came out a few years ago now. We haven't had anything new from her since then. And I'm ready. I need some more Lenny Taylor in my life. This book is amazing. It is a masterpiece. It is a triumph. It is what YA has the capacity to be and why I'm so mad when YA doesn't live up to this standard. But I'm mad at adult books for not living up to my standards too. It's really not just YA. It's purple and I hate that. The book itself is wonderful. I can't wait to gush about it to my patrons. Uh, next up is a book that apparently you can't really get. Um, that is The Lesser Devil and Other Stories by Christopher Rocchio. I know this was a limited release, um, this like signed and numbered edition. And I had previously read The Lesser Devil with Alex. This is the, these are Tales from the Sun Eater series. Um, and so Alex and I, uh, again, we will have the chat as of the filming of this video, but we have had the chat as of the going up of this video. Um, so we were combining talking about Kingdoms of Death with uh, the Lesser Devil and other stories. But so I, I think you can get the other stories individually, like on Kindle, but there is no other way, like there is no like regular edition of this collection. Like you can't get them bound up. Um, in like a regular unsigned edition, unfortunately. I discovered this when like I went to go rate this book and there's like 14 ratings. <laughs> it's only people that got this specific edition. But any whoosies, um, I, yeah, I had a good time reading this. I'd already read The Lesser Devil and the other stories are definitely interesting, fresh perspectives and insight into the rest of the world of Sun Eater. And are also interesting because they kind of show Christopher Rocchio's capacity to write in slightly different styles and in slightly different venues and like we've really just seen the sun eater and hadrian's story so here there's other characters other perspectives other situations other types of storytelling so it's kind of fun to see rocchio kind of stretch his creative muscles in these different directions so i'm excited to talk about this with alex and i'm sure whatever we said was great as you know because you've watched us chat and last but not least is a book that we already chatted about for like three hours. And that is Fire and Blood by George R. R. Martin because the Song of Ice and Fire read-along has finally come to an end. Jimmy, Alex, and I will never speak again. I mean, other than to talk about Sun Eater. Other than that, we will never speak again. Fire and Blood is a history book. It is basically literally a history book about, or the first part of the conquering of Westeros by the Targaryens. And I understand why people would find this dry and boring. Um, I tend to favor books that certain people would refer to as brilliant but unreadable, but I was so, so impressed with this because, I mean, to say, oh, this reads like a history book just sounds like a straight up insult, but it truly reads like a history book, like authentically like a history book with all of the like attention to detail of like how history books are written. The way in which history books will have to say, we don't know what happened because we don't have any accounts of this or because this document was lost or we have conflicting accounts of this. So maybe one of them is true, maybe none of them are true. So throughout, like to come up with so many different micro plot lines for all of the different things going on generation after generation with the Targaryens and all of the ways that that's affecting the politics of the world in an utterly believable ways um, and like the weird ways history sometimes shakes out or like it's not quite what you would think would happen, but the, oddly enough, like the way that people responded to this was this, which resulted in this, 
And then we don't really know what they did here because we lost the document. And like the way that it just is so believably a history book. It's how I was gobsmacked reading this and I truly enjoyed it. It wasn't just be like, you know, brilliant but unreadable. I wasn't just like, this is impressive, but like I'm bored. I was gripped by it because similarly to how I personally would be gripped by a history book where, you know, if you are reading a history book and you're like, you know, they tell you about some intense situation between two parties and then, you know, some pivotal moment happens and they're like, but we don't know what happened because no one was there, you know, no one was in the room where it happened, the room where it happened. Like stuff like that in a history book, you know, you're like, oh, but I wish I knew, like, oh, I'm so desperate to know what happened there. Or again, when you read a history book and you find out, you know, this tragic event that like, and then you read it and, and because it's true, it feels so much sadder, even though a history book is probably not going to be too narrative about it. It's not going to wax poetic and go into like emotional detail, but you know, it'll talk about the life story of this, of this famous figure and about how, you know, tragically they lost, you know, five of their six children in a house fire and they never really recovered from that. Like that's a gut punch when I read it in a history book. So similarly, when these Targaryens are experiencing love and loss and betrayal, even though it's told in this like history book way, in some ways, because it's told in such a dry historical way, it's more of a gut punch to me because I feel often if an author is trying too hard to get an emotional reaction out of me, writing in a very, you know, emotive way, I'm like, you're trying to get me to feel something. You're being really aggressive about it. Don't tell me what to feel. Don't tell me what to do. Whereas this where it's just presented as, yep, and then, you know, and then they died. And um, we don't really know how anyone felt about it because we lost the journals, but presumably they felt sad about it because, you know, the next thing they did was, you know, kill themselves or something. You know, like it's told in very arm's length way. And it's just the situation, which is an absolute gut punch. So I was so impressed with this. I really, really enjoyed this. And I also really enjoy chatting about this for like three hours <laughs> with Alex and Jimmy. So if you missed that and you're interested, then the replay is available for you. Um, and if you haven't read this book, um, I can't like universally recommend it, but the same way that I recommend, you know, Declaration of the Rights of Magicians or The Wolf or I don't know, other books where I'm like, if you're like me, I can't recommend this highly enough. A lot of people are nothing like me. Like I am by no means like representative of the average reader. Many, many extremely popular books I hate. So if you are like me, if you enjoy nerding about history, if you enjoy books that replicate the feeling of reading history, if you enjoy books that and in some ways nod to history because George R. R. Martin is drawing from his own knowledge of European history. And he's not just like retelling European history with dragons. But you can see where certain events in it are kind of like, oh, I think you're inspired by thus and such period of European history. So if you're like, if you love to nerd out about that and you are um, already interested in the Song of Ice and Fire series, the amount of like detail and fascinating world building and expansion of knowledge and lore and the, the sort of the way this colors the events and the understanding of events and the situations that we do get in the main series, this sort of the context this provides for that, it's it's just really, 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 really good. And anyone who says this is a lazy cash grab because I saw those reviews, I see you. Lazy? Lazy? I defy you to do something like this. This is arguably the hardest book out of anything that he's written to write. So don't. And those are all the books that I read in April. Let me know in the comments down below your thoughts and feelings about my thoughts and feelings. Whatever you want, let me know. I post videos on Saturdays, other random times as well, but definitely Saturdays, so like and subscribe. Join my Patreon if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you when I see you. Bye.